Hello there, welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 494. That's 494 of the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga. How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing, good to know. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like, hit subscribe, and of course, leave me a comment down below. I'd love to know your thoughts, feelings, and suggestions regarding the show topics that I will delve into later. And if you support, and if you want to support the show, so I started there. If you want to support the show via Patreon, please do. A link is in the description. You can click on it at patreon.com forward slash Agostino. You subscribe for as little as $1, the equivalent of £1 per month, and you get access to all of my bonus content. Everything that I do on there is only available for my Patreon subscribers, and it's only available for $1, the equivalent of £1 per month. Get involved. Don't delay. Get in there today. A bonus episode will be recorded at the end of this week. So if you want to get that, make sure you jump on the Patreon, and I'll be greatly appreciated. And of course, if you listen via the podcast app, a five-star review would go along way i've seen a lot of you do five star reviews lately i've seen the I think there's about 12 on there or something super grateful but if we can bump that up a little bit more i'd be really really appreciative of course reviews and all that stuff will help me get into the algorithm to help people you know it'll get recommended on certain pages so people can find it and of course if you've got friends and family who you think would like the stuff that i talk about recommend it to them also i would appreciate that from the bottom of my heart yeah, we're back, man. We're back. We're back. And I hope you are well wherever you are. It's sometime in the Friday evening. I just clocked off from work and I'm feeling good. I got back from the gym also quickly. Well, yeah, I had like a little bit of a gym session about four hours before this. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling in the zone. I'm back in the swing of things. I'm feeling in sync with my body, mind, body and soul and spirit. And oddly enough, I think it might have something to do with the employment, which is very strange in my experience, in my lifetime, it's very strange. If anybody has known me outside of the podcast world and in real life, I'm somebody who's had some very controversial, if not um, interesting hot takes when it comes to being employed, right? I'm not going to get into them, but you know, let's just say I've never really been the fan of having a full-time job or holding on to one for a long period of time. But with obviously COVID and the lockdown, and me having to do a lot of free freelancing part-time stuff and just seeing how that world is and you know for the time being and also having the inability of not being able to travel and do the things I enjoy during that time also made me kind of see things a little bit differently and also made me kind of realize some things about myself that I didn't really you know want to acknowledge prior one of the things which I always kind of knew but now I've kind of added a little bit to it is the fact that I need structure like I like structure, which is odd because I try and fight against it all the time, but I need structure or I need some sort of framework in order to fight against something in order to bring out the best in me when I'm going to do my other extracurricular activities. If I know I've only got two hours to work out because I've got to go back to work, I'm going to make that workout count. If I know I've only got six hours to go party, I'm going to make that party count. If I know I've only got, you know, four hours to prepare a DJ set before I before I go back to work, I'm going to make that DJ set the best available. You know what I mean? All these things are going to inform how I do this thing. Even when I was like blogging every day, I'd wake up at like six in the morning, smash out a draft, read over it, edit it, and then upload it. Do you know what I mean every single day? Because I knew I only had that couple of hours in the morning of uninterrupted sort of writing to get it done. So it kind of brought the best of me in that regard. But I used I always used to think if I had more free time, I would do that stuff like I would kind of just double down on that stuff and do it long and do it kind of throughout the day. So instead of waking up at 6 a.m. to write, I'd maybe wake up at 9 and just keep doing it as like a 9 to 5, quote unquote, and then bang it that way. But what I realized is that during COVID, when I had a lot of time in my hands, I generally, like a lot of people, I just got lazy, I got fat, I ate a lot, I didn't really do much, which, you know, there wasn't much to do, don't get me wrong. But I wasn't very, I wasn't, um, I didn't use that free time that I thought I would be using to the best of its advantage. Like somebody like myself, I'm sure a lot of people are like this too, who are really driven. You have this weird fantasy in your head that if you were ever locked up in prison, that would be the best and worst thing to happen to you because obviously the worst because, you know, you're locked in prison, but the best because you would be self-actualized. You could double down on the strengths. You could focus in on things that you wanted to do. You'd come out with a book or with a script or with some project. You know, all these little weird fantasies you have because you've had no distractions. But the truth of the matter is that I was wallowing. Do you know what I mean? I was spending a lot of my time wallowing and I think without the distraction of work it let it kind of yeah the distraction of being employed keeps you from wallowing especially if you're trying to pursue like a creative field I've had some very interesting debates with people with it some people would say that oh you need to be able to have you need to be able to concentrate you know as much as your energies and your time into your creative field as much as possible which I understand but in my opinion I've always been somebody that kind of adopts the kind of or adheres to the earning leisure side of things earning leisure side of things is like 
I'm going to toil in this construction yard from 9 till 6 or whatever it is, 9 till 4. And then on the weekends, I'm going to go super hard. And I'm going to go again on Monday. You know what I mean? And then go again, go again that way. So you earn your leisure. You earn the right to get on it. You earn the right to get blackout drunk. You earn the right to lose your wallet and your phone on the weekend because you decided to work, you know, strictly 9 to 5 on a, on a Friday, eating nothing but a flipping salad or Greg's every single morning and just bouncing, 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 or just going day, day after day, day after day. And then when it comes to the weekend, you go to enjoy yourself. Where some people would say, no i want to have that enjoyment throughout the entire week everyone's got different views i don't know to agree that when it comes to pursuing a creative field i also think that adheres to it or that kind of links to it because i also think that from the little experience i've got especially living in london most of the people that smashed it who are really successful here from the, what i saw were the people that came from outside of london not the people that were in london had all the access to all the people knew all the networks got all the events had all the jobs whatever it may be it was the people that had to come here like when they were 18 19 20 21 and had to kind of actualize themselves then are the ones that's made the most out of it because they saw it as a land of opportunity and they just went and attacked straight away they didn't kind of let rest on their laurels but i also think a good way to attack it if you are getting comfortable is to maybe have a nine to five that takes up a lot of your time and it restricts the hours or the amount of time that you have to spend on your thing that you want to do whether it's you know starting up a furniture store whatever i don't care what the flip it is when you have that job it kind of forces you to only spend a small amount of time doing the thing you actually enjoy which will inevitably if you're if it's the thing that you it's actually your calling something you actually love to do you will then make sure that those hours you're spending on the things that you're doing are like the best kind of fully focused hours that you've ever spent on anything in the hope that over time that kind of um the work that you do in a small amount of hours can then increase your yield increase your you know your sales whatever it may be so that you get to a point where you can suddenly put the full time to one side and pursue your dreams but i do honestly believe in the fact that having some sort of job it doesn't matter what it is don't get me wrong i've got a cool one at the moment but it can be anything working in a shop working in a cafe in a bar it doesn't matter as long as you've got something that's able to kind of occupy your time obviously and and, and also you know allow you to have some income coming in but then also restricts the time that you have available so that the time that you do have available to do your creative pursuits you have to be super locked in and not waste any time honestly i think that really does bring out the best in you from my experience that's what it brought out the best in me and i've definitely seen that over the last few weeks i've felt a lot more actualized i felt a lot more like on my on my on my on my thing you know, on my dean whatever it means you know what i mean i'm i feel like i'm on point i feel like i'm doing what i need to be doing like monday to friday i'm locking in when the weekend comes around, if I'm if I'm bothered, I'll go out. If not, I'll just lock in, prepare some stuff. Like, you know, I've got some mixes and stuff I've got to record. In the next few weeks, I'm going to do Empire. I'm going to start doing those every Friday because obviously the DJ bookings have kind of dried up now. So I'm just going to, you know, just let's just live stream some sets and play around and just live stream it and, you know, put it out to an audience and see what I want. That'll be fun. And of course, the photography stuff, I've got some writing stuff coming up. I'm just, all this stuff is kind of, you know, emanating out of me because my time is being restricted during the day because I'm working. I want to be in work mode so that when I'm out of work, I want to make sure i'm using that time as good as well as i can do you know what i mean i don't want to waste it i don't want to waste it now you know watching you know flipping hands made tales or something like that do you know what I, mean? I, I just don't have the time for it anymore whereas beforehand when i was loitering and just wallowing around i could watch four movies in a day and not really feel anything about it because i didn't really have anything to kind of push against and i think that's what i needed i need something to push against so then i could go and do my best work which is a bit weird but, you know, I'm kind of realizing that by myself now. You know, as you get older, you kind of actually, you kind of realize stuff about yourself that you like and you don't like. But then you also realize stuff about yourself that just is what it is. And you kind of have to kind of make the make the best of what it is, whatever trait it may be. Sometimes it can be destructive and it can be beneficial. But that's the kind of mood I've been in at the moment because I'm just flowing at the moment. I'm really, I'm flowing. The workouts are flowing. The going out is flowing. The the, the the doing all this stuff is flowing. Everything's just like on the, on the on this right path. So I'm hoping this feeling lasts. And in general, as long as I just keep my structure, I should be okay. And um, yeah, man, that's how I'm feeling at the moment. I don't know. Again, I've had a lot of debates about people with this as well. People are like, oh yeah, no, you should try and, if you're going to focus on your dream. Because some people out there would say, just work a nine to five, save lo loads of money like for six months or a year, and then use and then quit and then kind of give yourself a year to make it with your dream, which I think is obviously risky. Forget the risk. I don't care about risk, you know, because you, you don't, there is no um, living without any kind of risk. The risk isn't a big thing. It's just unnecessary. Why not just work and do your thing on top of it also? Like, because if it's actually your dream, you can do the whole, like, Gary, that's why Gary V comes in. He's really smart about it, this Gary Vaynerchuk, where he says, if it's something that you actually you want to pursue in your life, you should be able to commit to, like, doing it between the hours of, like, seven to one, which is kind of figuratively either counting for the time it takes you to leave the office, to having a drink with your friends. Or the, you should be able to to do your dream from nine to so, so seven to eight, what, seven p.m. to one a.m. if it's actually what you want to do. There's no need to, like, work and then not do anything and then, and then 
do it after you after a year. That just doesn't make any sense. But some people prefer to do. It. I don't know where you sit where you sit on that. But I'd love to know your thoughts and opinions on that kind of thing. Where do you land? Are you kind of the person that wants to keep a nine to five, whether it's working in a bar or working in a kind of quote unquote cool job in your industry so you can pursue your your dreams, your aspirations on the side? Or are you somebody that prefers to just lock in and work or bounce around, do part time work, save up some money and then just have like a six month, one year runway to just try and see if you can make it happen? I'd love to know what your idea is, where you stand on it. Let me know in the comments down below. I'd really, really appreciate it. But anyway, moving on, we've got bare topics to talk about. So make sure you grab yourself a drink or something or nibble on if you're that way inclined. And we're going to just dive on deep before a glass, glass of water. Fucking humid out here, man. Sweating like a fucking pig. Anyway, let's go. So number one, my chair's creaking as well. So don't watch that. Number one topic to get through at the moment we've got this courtesy of the independent vaccine passports against my dna admits minister but confirms nightclub plan to go ahead um proof of jabs for venue entry goes against everything i believe in says nadim zahawi so as you guys are aware in the uk or you should be aware i think i mentioned it a couple of times on the pod um the uk is looking to introduce a vaccine passport for all kind of basically nightlife um, venues and whatnot um, at the beginning of october so the idea or the premise is the only way we're going to keep the industry open is to kind of in a weird way coerce people to make sure they get double jabbed so that they can go to these places because at the moment um vaccine adhesion is not where it needs to be for the young people going to these kind of venues and they want to obviously stop an outbreak or whatever spike and going out the spike in cases sorry and obviously that might eventually lead to death and it's been interesting that for the most part the compliance has been quite high i've seen i've not really seen a lot of people pushing back on the use of vaccine passports there, obviously there is a small contingency that are obviously naturally going to be against something like this but for the most part most of the debate that i saw the protest was mainly around the idea of closing these venues and not allowing them to open under any circumstances which obviously was happening prior to us reopening or prior to nightlife or the hospitality industry reopening you know sometime at the end of last year people are really getting annoyed in that regard right so thinking oh if we can go to a supermarket why can't I go to a nightclub it's both the same kind of levels of risk and reward obviously it could be argued but that definitely was something that was definitely put out there and now going forward it looks like the vaccine passports is going to be implemented because there was talk about it you know is it going to happen is it not going to happen but considering the cases and considering where we're at and how tentative it is and obviously with it being flu season they don't want to risk anything happening and you know, if to be completely honest, if I'm completely, completely honest, from the time that I've been, how do you say it? From the time that I've been out, for the most part, especially with the lateral flow test, they're decent, don't get me wrong. But like I've said, mentioned before, I'm not really sure I'm doing them correctly. Um, I don't really have the best gag reflex in the world, shock horror. And whenever I try to swab myself, especially with a little thing at the back of the, the back of the tonsils, in, I always kind of stop after a couple. And I don't, I'm not really sure if I even touch it because, you know, again, my gag reflex is horrible. And then whenever I try to do it up my nose because I've got hay fever sometimes, I'm full of bogey or whatever. Do you know what I mean? So I don't know if it's actually, you know, getting up there or if it's just full of bogey. I don't really know. But whenever I've kind of put it in a solution and I've gone to go get myself tested, it's always come out negative. It's not come out inconclusive or anything. So that's been the problem. I'm not really sure if, this, if these PCR tests are actually legit it if you're actually getting a negative result but it's the best thing that we have available but it's also interesting to see that a lot of these club nights i think recently i saw crossbreed saying it the other day where they're like oh even when the vaccine passports come in you they're going to still require patients to have a pcr test so they, they're doing the extra layer on top just to make sure that that you know nothing goes wrong which i can understand as well because if you're a part of the nightlife industry or in hospitality industry or whatever the last thing that you want it's to go back to a life where you are not able to work, right? It's just not something, it's not a reality that anybody wants. I mentioned it prior, the parties recently have been amazing in London. It's been so good. Everyone's been in such a good mood. People have been getting maybe a little bit too wasted, but for the most part, people are absolutely loving being outside again. And I don't think people that work in the industry could ever picture a reality where they have to not do that anymore. So if you want to keep it going or keep the party going, you would obviously ask the people that attend your parties to be like, hey, I know this is annoying, but if you, even if you've got a vaccine passport, I'm still going to want you to do a PCR test, which, again, is probably going to test some people's patience. But in all, you know, the, the what you call it, the compromise, you know, the the bargaining here isn't that much really to has to to kind of argue over really is it either you do the pcr test and try and keep the numbers to a sensible level or you don't the numbers spike and then the government do what they always do and blame nightlife industry and then close us down first before anybody else no one wants that anyway go back to the article so the following 
Vaccines Minister has defended the government's plan to bring in the COVID passports for nightclubs and other venues this month, but admitted the pained, it pained him to introduce something which goes against everything he believes in. Nadim Zahawi confirmed the nightclubs and large-scale venues in England would be forced to require proof of two vaccination jabs as a condition of entry by the end of September, but conceded that his own reservations... Okay, by the end of September, it's not even the beginning of October. So, you have to, so again, it... It's really difficult for people that don't have the vaccine because you're going to have to get double jabbed relatively quickly to ensure that you're able to, I don't know, go out for Halloween or go out for like New Year's Eve or something, which are usually some bigger, two of the biggest kind of like uh, partying times in London or in the UK in general. It goes on, it says ministers um, suggested MPs would get a vote in the policy which backbenchers described as authoritarian, difficult for the hospitality industry to implement at such short notice. Yeah, that's the thing that I'm really going to be interested in. For the clubs, is one thing. At the moment, every club I've been to, they've got their protocols of how they, um, ad you know, admit people into the club where they kind of, you know, make sure. I think most places, base most places I've been to, they just make sure you have the text or you yeah, basically they make sure you have you've had you've been PCR tested and you've got the confirmation test 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 text text or email before you even approach to show your ticket so that that way if you don't have it they can quickly kind of tell you to keep it moving and then everyone else can get their ticket and carry on do you know what I mean so that everyone's got a process but would at a pub what are you gonna do at a pub are you going to ask people to show their PCR test or their negative sorry their vaccine passports when they order the beer when they step into your venue outside of your venue like what, what, how's it gonna adhere would that be would that mean they have to hire an extra staff member is that gonna be a security staff to, to secure your ask for more money it's just a weird place to be at the moment so it continues it says um it just it says a quote here it says it pains me to have to have to stand at this uh, dispatch box and have to implement something that goes against the dna of this minister and his prime minister but we're living through a difficult time says mr zahawi insisting the government did not um want to curtail people's freedoms he added that it was difficult for me to do it it goes against everything i believe in but it's the right thing to do despite his own reservation mr zahawi claimed the policy would needed to prevent large venues from acting as a host for super spreader spikes in the covid infection just I, I hate all these fucking things things that starting i'm not gonna touch it um conservative mp william warg um accused the minister of talking rubbish and starting a needless fight with mps over the certification plan accusing him of defending the indefensible mr w mr rugg said the following i don't believe he believes a word of what he's just uttered because i remember him persuasively start, start stating my position that this measure would be discriminatory which it obviously is that's again it's discriminatory it's all for terror it's it's all for Authoritarian, authoritarian. How, how, how do you say that word? Authoritarian. Jesus, my English is going mad at the at ways. I mean, it's like something at nineteen eighty four. We know, but unfortunately, we are living in unprecedented times, and this just seems like the only time in you know in history where we're gonna somehow have to put aside our morals and our principles and our ideals in order for a greater future because i don't really see any other way how you can keep clubs open without having some sort of vaccination passport or even just a pcr test it's just not going to be likely do you know what i mean like the ideal thing would be like you know clubs before you enter would administer a pcr test to everybody that walks through the door that way you'd have a better idea of if people are negative or positive because again people can get vaccinations and still get vaccines the lateral flow tests are not the most accurate representation of somebody's negative or positive but PCR tests are obviously the best of the bad bunch. But then again, imagine trying to set up a flipping PCR test booth outside of a nightclub. Good luck. I, I, most people, you probably wouldn't even be able to fit that brush, that little thing up their nose in the first place because it'd be so blocked, full of all the gunk that they've been ingesting over the last couple of months. So I don't know, man. It's, it's a mad place to be in. And then, of course, we've got a following article here that kind of touches on the chaos it's going to bring. It says, COVID passport plan is chaotic, nightclubs say. And nightclubs say the government's plan to only let people in with vaccine passports to venues is chaotic and surreal. The government said that people with COVID statuses will be a condition of entry in clubs and for some indoor venues by the end of the month. The industry figures um, say that there's still a lot of unanswered questions and little information about how clubs are supposed to enforce the rules. The government says it will be a provide more detail soon. Michael Keel is from the Nighttime Industry Association that says it's almost surreal that ministers expect venues to be ready for the changes when they still don't have answers for many questions. It's not clear, for example, exactly which venues will be affected. The government says it's nightclubs and other places or large venues. Okay, they still haven't they still haven't specified if it's going to be nightclubs and pubs or just nightclubs in general or concert halls. I get what they're saying here. It continues at the moment, people can get an NHS and COVID app by having two jabs, proving they're immune for the virus or showing a recent negative COVID test. Festivals, gigs, and other large events have been using QR code scanners to check people's COVID passports 
passports um, before electing them in the events. I'm sure there's a black market for that stuff too. I just imagine it. Um, both clubs say that they need to send scanners and train door staff. Is this going to work for them? Are you true? You're going to have to, either they're going to have to be sent scanners or have to buy them off the black market. I love this person's outfit, man. Looks banging. Um, continues. Aaron Meller from Tokyo Industries says that he had no indication from the government about what the process of checking passports would involve. Michael Kill said staffing and technology and everything to get the to put in place. So it's a real concern that they're leaving this to the last minute, as they always do. Um, it's just so little, so late for something which is quite considerable impact on our sector. Way too little, too late in terms of information and communication. There is so much work to do in terms of defining who and what needs to be done. The list is endless. So for me, it's surreal that we're sat here um, the second week of September we're still guessing the government argues that the NHS COVID app will ensure the economy can stay open which is relatively true to be honest it's just a shame that we're having to get to this point in it it really is just a shame and again um so far from that nightlife scene I've not seen a lot of pushback from it I've seen a lot of people probably be quite down for it the most pushback I saw was when I went on the um the Berlin Cup Commission Instagram page there's a lot of people getting a bit pissy about the fact that you needed to have a covid um a negative covid well a covid passport in order to go to a nightclub and dance indoors but everyone else it seems like seems to agree or seems to be okay with this sort of compromise in order to go out and again the parties have been so good last weekend even myself and i'm quite a principled moral kind of guy and i was very much against the passports but even i had to kind of acquiesce and say like you know what if this is one bit of privacy or one bit of data points i have to give up in order to allow myself to do the one thing that i legitimately enjoy doing especially when you're adult age i say it's a lot it's really hard to find new friends and it's also doubly hard to find hobbies when you're an adult especially when you're above the age of like 25 because you don't just randomly bump into people or do things that are fun you sometimes get into you get you kind of you kind of grow into who you actually are you kind of get into a bit of a rut sometimes i mean you get caught in you get caught kind of being a little bit um resting on your laurels if that makes sense right when you're a bit older whereas when you're younger you can kind of fall into social groups and fun things just by the mere fact of just being out and about so when you're a bit older and you're above the age of 25 having the ability to go to a party which might eventually lead to you maybe meeting some cool new people is something that is so amazing and so exhilarating and literally gives you a reason to live or a reason to kind of keep trudging on and you're flipping dead end job in a week it really doesn't bear even imagining not having the ability to do that so if someone tells you hey you have to get double jabbed and you have to have this NHS app on your phone and have a little PTR test that takes you like, you know, 30 minutes, if that, to complete at home. Like, you're going to you're gonna, you're gonna take it. You're going to take it, especially if you spent the most part of 18 months at home alone doing nothing. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't really see a, a, I don't really see a, a, an adequate argument against that sort of stuff, in my opinion. But hey, maybe I'm wrong. Moving on and changing tax completely there has been this really strange and odd debate that's been brewing on the social media feed that i've never really i've kind of understood but also kind of makes me a bit sad for humanity in general and there's this weird debate that people have been you know talking back and forth about which is the dinner with jay-z or five hundred thousand debate which i've seen you know pop up from time to time on the timeline but for some reason it kind of captured everyone's imagination over the last couple of days because probably people are bored and got nothing to do and basically the premise behind it is that the question is that oh because jay-z is such an influential and you know incredibly successful rich billionaire hip-hop dude um would you rather have a dinner with him where he can maybe unlock the keys and tell you some information that you would never have gotten or you know had the opportunity to maybe break bread with him so he can maybe become a future mentor to you whatever it may be or do you rather take the cash and use that cash to 500,000 specifically 500,000 dollars or pounds in order to kind of invest in your business and to me it sounds kind of or to, just to have you so I don't know whatever you want to do if you even want to spend on flipping pokemon cards to me it sounds like a bit of a no brainer take the money of course right this idea this idea that somehow sitting down with jay-z is going to be worth more to your life than five than what five hundred thousand can do for the immediacy of your bills and your family or whatever you want to do is preposterous and if anything speaks to this idea or speaks to this weird assertion that people have where they want to be like co-signed and brought in that's where it kind of thing it comes from they think like the look and the networking and this is the reason why x y and z person successful i think it obviously is true in some people's cases you look at somebody like who i featured on my podcast and channel on youtube a lot someone like a brendan Shaw, who a lot of people really hate and part of the reason why a lot of people hate him is because they think genuinely that he's terrible at what he does and they also generally think that he's only at the level that he's at because of that 
like Joe Rogan co-sign, right? Joe Rogan puts him on his, on his podcast, it boosts his profile, that then helps his podcast grow, and then he goes and does his own thing. But what they're missing is that he's still working hard recording his own podcast. Two or three, I think he's got like five now, he does it in a week, even if they're not of good quality. He's still having to sit down and do them, produce them, put them out there, whatever it may be, making merch. So what that Joe Rogan co-sign do, what did is just amplify his voice, right? But it's not as if like Joe Rogan gave him a career, Right, he already had one, and Joe Rogan basically allowed him the platform to maybe get the opportunity to get sponsors, to get more downloads on his show, to get more AdSense money, to maybe book more comedy shows, whatever it may be called. That's what it usually gets you. But so it's really, it's really kind of naive to think you can go from a zero, not doing anything, just sit down with a Jay Z, and that's enough. Or you zero and sit down with Joe Rogan, that's enough. I would imagine the Joe Rogan example is the best example because, for the most part, apart from comedians for the for the most part everybody that sits down with joe rogan on these podcasts usually has something to promote whether it's them as a service whether it's a product they're releasing whether it's a new study they're working on they've always got something that they want to sit down and talk about and then from there they kind of that's that kind of like the launching off point and then kind of meander off to, to different topics but there's no one that goes on there just to kind of sit there just to kind of figure out what they want to do with their life they don't really do that do you know what I mean? maybe it might happen in the course of a conversation with somebody but you don't just go in there and be like oh joe help me out i don't know what i'm doing i'm confused that doesn't happen you have to kind of figure out what you want to do in order for for me in my head i would think figure out your own life then that will make the jay-z dinner worthwhile right because then you'd be in a position where like you know you're making five hundred thousand dollars worth in sales whatever you're doing or you've got enough opportunities or enough things in the in the you know enough bookings in the background that it wouldn't really cost you much to kind of take maybe the opportunity of sitting down with someone like that and not take the monetary value which a lot of people would argue hey sitting down with jay-z is once a last opportunity the money you could always make but i don't necessarily guarantee i don't necessarily think that's true i don't think most people are going to make 500,000 in their lifetime. I know I will because I, I, I believe in my abilities and my talents and shit and I'm a hard worker in that regard and I know if I can keep on doing the things that I'm doing to the level I'm doing, eventually I'll get there. It doesn't matter if, I, if it's not now when I'm 50 or when I'm 60 or whatever it may be. But still, most people don't, won't even earn 500,000 in their lifetime. So having the ability to take that money and be able to kind of, you know, maybe give, give some money to your family, take your mum on holiday, give your brother something, um, I don't know, pay some debts off. That's a big deal. You should maybe do that instead of thinking about the sitting down and networking and sitting down with somebody like a Jay-Z that's going to show you. No, it's not going to do nothing. And again, I've all, I think maybe it comes from my own deep-rooted resentment for the scene and stuff I've grown up in, especially in London, you know, trying to traverse a network of in the streetwear, DJ, nightlife scene and stuff, whatever I've seen around places. Like, I've hated all of, I, I, the, the reason why I hate kind of like, you know, loitering and kind of, you know, making friends in there for the most part was that most of the people were just trying to obviously run up the ladder and clout chase but most of it was like everyone was looking for a cosign looking for something to hold the door open for them to help them out put them on the list all this sort of shit i was like nah i want to be undeniable in what i do on my own regard fair enough if somebody can do you a favor and put in the list that's all well and good safe for that jeremy i could jump and not have to queue up and whatnot outside in the cold but for the most part i'd love to be like I'd love to be kind of considered as a peer to these people as opposed to somebody that's just waiting there for handouts or waiting for an opportunity or waiting for somebody to kind of give you a wink or something. Nah, that's not the game. And if anything, the heroes I kind of look up to, the people that I'm kind of wanting to emulate, the Hiroshi Fujiwaras, the DJ Harveys, the Larry Levines, um, whoever it may be, right? Um, the Seymour Powells, the design studios, right? All these people, they're just like humans like you and I and they just went and did the thing. They didn't wait for somebody to give them a handout, to give them a cosign. They just did the thing. They became undeniable. And then people started sucking them off. Do you know what I mean? That's how it kind of works out. And then you and then, then you become the person in the Jay-Z position where people are saying, oh, yeah, I want to just sit down with coffee and just, you know, I want to, you know, um, uh, touch base and, you know, break bread and have it, whatever it may be. Then you become that person. But this idea that somehow a meeting with Jay-Z is going to change your life more than maybe 500,000 would, especially for like a general dude just sitting doing nothing, guy or girl, is batshit crazy so the article here from the um, hip hop dx is the following a friendly debate erupted on twitter earlier this month earlier this week sorry that had the hip hop fans choosing between dinner with jay-z and 500,000 half of the course the responses were mixed some hope fans got really deep about their belief so it is what it is um one person said the following i'll explain since most can't comprehend did it with jay-z is the better option over 500,000 because of the knowledge and expertise that he has he'll give you the blueprint on being wealthy and successful his knowledge will be worth long term than the short term 500,000 that's insane what do you how, how long do you think dinners last do you think he's going to sit down with you and and pull out a flipping whiteboard and go through your entire life and how you're able to do things and to kind of you know make more money or get more deals or whatnot and also there's an argument to be had for how good of a businessman is jay-z really 
Like, is he just what? Is he just the equivalent of what every other rich person or somebody with notoriety is in this position? Where no, don't get me wrong. Let's let's rewind that. Maybe Jay Z, what he's been able to do has been to be, he's been very successful or very, he's very good at what he does, right? Which is rapping, right? That's his that's his bread and butter. He's been you know r widely regarded as the best as the best to ever do it. Being the best that you ever do it in your field allows you the opportunity to get some deals, allows you the opportunity to maybe get some looks that you probably wouldn't get if you wasn't Jay-Z, right? If you, if you, if you wasn't Jay-Z, you probably wouldn't be getting some of those deals and some of those contracts, some of those looks because you're not the best ever did it. Because obviously there's a mutual benefit from the person that wants to give you the deal and from you obviously coming in and, you know, and whatever, working on some sort of plan. So this idea that he has some sort of like, you know, savant level business expertise is really stupid because he's been able to really make it work for himself but whether or not he can do that for others is remains to be seen especially just strangers that he hasn't necessarily interacted with previously and obviously this this dude too side hustle king is definitely one of those guys that has like you know a course on gum road that he sells and stuff about how to buy stuff off amazon and flip on ebay and all that nonsense right so it makes sense for him for him something like that maybe having um, an insight into maybe how jay-z saves money or how he invests or how he puts things on payment plans I don't know, whatever. There'll be some little tidbit that he could use that would obviously help him going forward. But for the average folk, it's definitely something that doesn't make any sense. And obviously the Tidal account then hit back and said, take the 500,000, which obviously everyone um, knew with common sense. Um, let's see. Was, uh, nothing, no, nothing else to read. Yeah, but yeah, that's just, again, stupid debate. Didn't even make any sense at the time. But again, goes to show the obsession that we have with celebrities in general, right? It's kind of unhealthy. And also this weird idea that people have that if you just sat down with the right person, if you bumped into the right person, if you were in front of the right person, if you were sat next, all this stuff is somehow going to allow you to go and reach the levels that you need to reach in order to actualize your dreams. No, most of the time, 99% of the time is down to you. Can you come back from work and dedicate 7 p.m. to 1 p.m. to your dreams consistently, Monday to Sunday, without without interruption, without kind of, you know, mistake, without dropping it off? Can you do that back to back to back? Can you forego weddings, um, funerals, anniversaries, holidays, so you can actualize your dreams and do it? Then, yeah, commit to it in that way. And then if that doesn't work for like a good 5, 10 years, then maybe... It might be an option to go sit down with a JJ or somebody who's kind of mentor so they can maybe, you know, you could maybe just ask, am I just doing this wrong? Should I just give up and do something else? Maybe that might be a good idea. But if you're just starting out or you're just on the road to getting your thing, wasting your time sitting down with Jay-Z to have a chat, it's just, it just doesn't make any sense personally. But again, I could be in a minority. Um, and then to move on. Da -da 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 oh, yeah. Sad news here. Courtesy of Club News News. Courtesy of Resident Advisor. The cause in north london here in the uk is unfortunately announced that it's going to close in its current format which is no surprise i think when they opened the idea was that they kind of opened on a temporary basis they were sort of like the equivalent of like a property guardian we had this sort of system here in the uk a few years ago i don't think it exists too much now but i remember i was looking at it in terms of when i wanted to first move out how when i first wanted to move out of my parents home is a thing that i looked at and the, basically the property guardian scheme was um where this kind of there was these different firms who basically had these connections to these buildings and um, that were meant to be demolished or were kind of changing hands, or especially usually the skyscrapers and really weird places like old people's homes and whatnot. And in that kind of interim period where they kind of sorting out the deal and ironing out contracts and whatnot, they would have people kind of live in them and as like kind of living living security guards but basically guardians right property guardians and you'd pay a really like subsidized fee it'd be like maybe 400 400 pounds per month which in the uk is just you know ridiculously cheap and you have like an amazing space maybe it might be an office space with just a divider and whatnot um the water would be paid for and then you have to maybe add in amenities onto it other, other bits and bobs but you've got to live in some really cool interesting spaces and i think that's the same sort of thing kind of similar what the cause did where they basically were able to kind of um reuse or kind of repurpose a space for a temporary period because uh, you know this big deal was going on in terms of turning that whole area into really shiny um glass and metal skyscrapers and in the interim they had a license and they were able to kind of throw these amazing parties you know that went into kind of you know london club um folklore and whatnot and, and again it's been one of the my favorite places to go to because i think it, it is really 
unique in its kind of programming i think it kind of started off being a little bit more drum and bassy uk garage sort of heavy but then it also kind of segued into the kind of tech sort of hard dance um queer sort of scene which is really amazing to see and every weekend you just look on their instagram of the pictures they post there's a completely different crowd that kind of goes to the cause depending on what night is on and i quite like that because it keeps it really fresh it keeps it really interesting and in general it's just a really cool place to be it's one of the only places to open sometime after five i think most times it's open until until 5 or 6 a.m it's a brilliant place and i've also got a nice little terrace you can go to it's really nice and the people that run it are awesome so again um it's sad um of course bittersweet but the great thing is that they also have a, a kind of permanent home that i think they're still kind of fixing up at the moment and they're hopefully going to segue into after they um leave this uh place that they're at in the moment i think it's going to end sometime this end of this year but let's read the article and it'll kind of point it out it says London Club The Cause has revealed that what could be its final series of shows in its present form with the team anticipating operational issues in the coming months due to the fast paced development of its surrounding sites. The Cause has announced that it may turn out to be its final few months of programming. It marks the last chapter in the historic checkered in the history checkered with council and licensing issues and the Tottenham Club have been shuttered temporarily due to a planned property development in 2019. The writing really was on the wall for the cause in its current form and we're absolutely gutted to see the club winding down. It really does feel like the odds are stacked against us with the multi-story residential buildings rising up all against all around us and all the challenges we undoubtedly will face in the impending residence titled the beginning of the end the series will include um w w the series of shows will go on until the late november such as a four-day bothering festival um Lob lobster fest which is lobster ferryman i think week uh, weekend you've got um highlights of benny ufo move D, blah, 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 blah. and i think i'm going there for one of the last parties too i'm going to see tricks um from innovisions playing there so that should be a fun one and again i've got a picture here kind of highlighting the pains that they're at the moment you know they've got the cores here you've got these shiny buildings you've got all the cranes in the sky so it's definitely evident it's definitely clear that they have to be able to move because unfortunately whenever you see these things going up around you these new people come in they kind of justify the area they complain about the noise and the pollution even though they moved there specifically because they like how cool and kooky it is but then they end up complaining because they end up paying the most rent they get the voices they get the say and then you have to get kicked and moved on but like i said it's one of the unique and best positions because they're able to basically trial um, their offering into the clubbing space. People were able to kind of kind of gauge what the cause is about. Um, they were able to trust their programming, trust what they do as a team, how they put nights on, the security, all that good stuff. So wherever they end up landing, you know, permanently on their feet, people I'm sure will follow. So again, it's bittersweet. The end is only the start of the beginning. And I'm hoping that the new space is going to be just as interesting and as cool to kind of rave in as their obviously spot that they have here at the moment moving on moving on oh my god what's that again i'm so humid today so oh yeah you see this this is flipping mad right this is courtesy of sky sports new or sky news sorry so jeff bezos amazon founder funds a new age reversal company opening in the uk this must be the last frontier when it comes to being one of the mega wealthies right the billionaire class out there you basically can have it all. Your lifestyle is basically, you know, it's basically whatever you want to do, especially when you get to that kind of level of success. You've bought everything that you want. And then I think uh, outside of maybe space and maybe conquering other planets or colonizing other planets and being a multiplanetary species, the only other thing that you can do is maybe to kind of have some sort of age reversal. Um, you know, again, is eternal youth, yeah? Exactly. Sipping on a fountain of eternal youth. And it seems like, um, the mega rich I was obsessed by I remember this one guy who appeared on Joe Rogan I think it was some guy some guy that was a specialist in all this kind of stuff was basically say that that was usually the number one question that you'd always be asked if you went to some sort of rich banquet dinner guy thing they would always kind of it would always eventually get to that point about age reversal what sort of you know developments are in are in vogue at the moment what supplements help the most, all this kind of mad stuff. You see something like a Joe Rogan's consistently talking about that kind of thing of how long he can continue looking the way that he does, you know, working out, taking HGH, all this kind of stuff is stuff that they're trying to do in order to kind of suspend or to put off kind of old age and being kind of crumpled up in a chair somewhere because, you know, these guys kind of want to enjoy every last minute they have available on this earth. And if they can continue forever, they absolutely would. Um, it continues here, says, a new startup that aims to reverse aging is planning to open a lab in the UK. 
Altos Labs has raised at least 231 million pounds to develop biological reprogramming um, technology, a way to rejuvenate cells that some scientists think could be extended to revitalizing the entire animal bodies, ultimately prolonging human life. That is wild. I've heard of kind of the, um, you know, prolonging human life in the uh, in the sense of like your brain, right? In terms of kind of improving your cognitive ability so that when you're older, you're still kind of sharp and you don't sound slurred or kind of slowed or whatever it may be like sometimes leading to how it is when you're old but i've never really heard of people actually say no we want you physiologically physio ph physiologically or physiologically to be to kind of you know have a, a kind of a suspended birthday right so you're kind of always at a particular age looking wise like that must be wild it continues this, that the company was incorporated in the US and in the UK earlier this year is reported to have billionaires um, Jeff Bezos and Yuri Milner among the investors according to MIT Technology Review. Um, Sinya Yamaka, who shared a 2012 Nobel Prize on the discovery of the program, will act as the unpaid senior scientist and will chair the company's scientific advisory board. He found that with the addition of four other proteins, cells can be instructed to revert to a primitive state with the properties of the embryonic stem cells. Um, Carlos, Impu Carlos S. How do you say that? Carlos is Pizua uh, Beltone, a Spanish scientist, also reportedly joining Autos, applied uh, those principles to entire living mice, achieving signs of age reversal and leading him to term the reprogramming a potential exceller of life. He also predicted that human lifespans could be increased by 50 years. So I think if you give a billionaire 50 years, there obviously that's an interesting part about it, right? Billionaires want to live forever and people, you know, living on the poverty line just want to ensure that they're able to kind of, you know, put their kids through school, have meals on their table and whatnot. And they're happy to go out when their kids are, you know, young or their kids are old enough to have kids. They've seen their grandkids grow up a little bit and they're happy to peace out. But it's the billionaires who just want to hang around forever and ever and ever. It's just like, Jesus, man, go away. Let other people come up as well and be rich too. But hey, continue. Um, uh, da, da, da. It says here, yeah, although some of the mice in the experiment showed signs that the tissue had become younger, other developed um, ugly embryonic tumors and called teratomas, which can be cancerous. Ooh, that, they didn't mention that at the top of the story, did they? Right? So it's either you become, you know, you, you end up being Benjamin Button, you end up looking young as hell, you end up being, you know, a kind of modern day Pharrell, or you get cancer. What do you want? And I know there's billionaires out there that would be willing to roll the dice on that because they're like, why not? You know what I mean? I'm going to die anyway. But if I can extend my years for 50 or die, then my decision is going to be made either or. So I get it. It says here, although there are many hurdles to overcome, this is a huge potential, said you, Mr. Yamaka, Mr. Yamanaka, sorry. Um, another expert joining the firm was Steve Horath, a UCLA professor and developer of biological clock that can accurately measure human aging and the effectiveness of an, an, any aging reversal drug developed. At least initially, Altos will be paying researchers million dollar salaries with no immediate expectation for the products or revenues. Other startups have been looking at programming and other sources have been looking at reprogramming technology, including UK-based Shift Bioscience, but their efforts have not yet been led to any treatments led uh, tested on the people or in clinical trials. Calico Labs, a longevity company announced in 2013 by the Google founder Larry Page, also runs a lab focused on reprogramming. So yeah, interesting times ahead for you if you're a rich billionaire and you want to extend your life. There are companies out there looking at these kind of things. Uh, we've got, of course, eventually their breakthroughs will end up kind of touching us regular folk too, but we have to wait a couple of months or moments before that ends up happening. But yeah, interested to see none the less. <laughs> Moving on. Oh yeah, this is a big one, isn't it? So Curse to the BBC, I've been seeing this pop up again and again because obviously the, the date of the, no, the trial is actually undergoing at the moment despite you know, numerous delays and Elizabeth Holmes declaring herself pregnant and some people think it would be a little bit, you know, dubious if she was pregnant or she did it on purpose, sorry. But I've been seeing this all over the timeline recently, the Ferrino scandal. I think most people, most of you guys are aware where this young lady, Elizabeth Holmes, was tied as the next big thing in Silicon Valley. She was really young. Um, she dropped out of university or dropped out of college. And she was starting up this startup that was going to lead the way in the, bio, in the, in the medicine field. It was this thing that you could basically analyze your blood at home with this prick system. Get it analyzed on your phone and an app. And you'd be given or you may maybe be administered medicines directly through your machine. Or be able to kind of early um, diagnose things really early based on the blood sample that you're able to give. So 
there's some really cool and interesting kind of you know um, solutions that that machine or that startup was eventually going to solve on the paper it sounded flipping incredible she looked really really impressive too she had a turtleneck on she had the weird deep voice really smart and charming whatever she spoke places and obviously she had these big blue eyes blonde lady she's not you know she's not bad to look at and all that stuff so it ticked all the boxes but of course, you know, um, everything that glitters isn't gold. And this uh, investigative journalist who ended up writing the book, which I think is something, what's it called? Something blood, I think it's called something like bad blood, something like that. I read, I think I listened to it on the, auto, on the audio book a few, couple of years ago. But regardless, he kind of dug in a bit deeper and found out that the machine didn't do what it said it did. If anything, Elizabeth Holmes was basically faking the whole thing. She'd go and pretend that the that she was taking a sample, put it in the machine and put it in a normal machine. Just some really created crazy crazy stuff but the worst thing that she could have done obviously off the back of that was the money it seems like i don't think people are that bothered that she kind of duped a lot of the patients into believing the machine worked the way it did i think most of the thing which i think is at the center of the trial is the money that she's able to swindle out some really big investors obviously one of the biggest being rupert murdoch who effectively i think invested somewhere between like a hundred and 20 million dollars or something should be like that into this machine and obviously most of that money is completely gone if anything um, maybe eviscerated in complete eclipse in there no one knows and there's obviously been mainly many documentaries out there about her um, on podcast form and you know some video audio documentaries that you can kind of, kind of check out but I just think it's interesting I just think it's an interesting case to kind of keep an eye on from the outside especially now when you think about her defense at the moment her defense is that that she's trying to put up is that this idea that her um, partner I think it might be the the the, the 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 father to a recently born child who also was an advisor or sat on a board I think at Theranos she's now alleging that this guy was the one that was pressuring her and abusing her behind the scenes which led her to do some of the more despicable things that she did running Theranos which is interesting because when she started Theranos the whole idea was that she was the ultimate girl boss right she was the one in charge she called all the shots she had a big say on the board nothing basically got approved about her say so like she was Billy Big Balls and now suddenly that she's in trouble she's saying oh no it wasn't me I was just damn on that damn's on the stress I had no idea what was going on like so 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 heinous so this article courtesy of BBC it says fair no scandal who's lived with Holmes and why is she on trial it says she was the world's youngest self-made billionaire trumpet triumph um trumpeted Ford magazine the next Steve Jobs said Inc another business magazine that put her on a cover in 2014 Elizabeth Holmes then 30 years old was on top of the world a Stanford University dropout she founded a company valued at nine billion for supposedly bringing about a revolution in diagnosing disease with a drop of a few blood fairness promises that their fairness fairness so theranos promised that its edison test could detect conditions such as cancer and diabetes quickly without the hassle of needles. Big wiggers like Henry Kissinger and Rupert Murdoch sat on the board, but by 2015, um, seams were coming apart, and within a year, Miss Holmes was exposed as a fake. The technology she touted did not work at all, and by 2018, the company she founded had collapsed. Uh, Miss Holmes now faced seven face faces charges of up to 20 years in prison if found guilty of fraud charges against her. She has never previously told her side of the story. Her trial, U.S. Holmes versus Elizabeth Holmes trial, will be closely watched, and she is expected to plead not guilty. In a twist that emerged this weekend, her lawyers will argue that her ex-boyfriend and business partner Remis Sunny Belwani sexually abused and emotionally controlled her at the time of the alleged crimes impairing her mental state. Mr. Belwani, 56, who faces a similar charges, called the claims outrageous. It will then be up to the jury to decide that what sympathy or harshness the judge and the woman who fought everyone from statesmen to secretaries. It's crazy, isn't it? imagine being and if you see this guy this sunny dude he doesn't look at like somebody that's ever going to abuse a woman again looks can be deceiving i know but if ever there was somebody i was just probably happy to have a girlfriend happy to have somebody that looks like her kind of paying him attention that would be the kind of guy to think that he's ever going to be somebody that's going to be abusing a woman especially under that kind of guise is completely irrational and then we move on of course to these kind of interesting articles courtesy of the guardian that says elizabeth home trial spell the end of a girl boss era i don't necessarily think it does i think if anything it shouldn't really be a way to kind of because I've seen some people do it where they're basically saying, see, women are dumb too. No, women can be um, uh, duplicitous and conniving and sociopathic too. No one was denying that. But I don't think it's that case. I just think it's a case of, if anything, it basically exposes the fallacy that exists within startup world, right? Especially when it comes to investing in these startups and, and you know, uh, placing your bets in somebody that's going to become the next Airbnb or the next Uber or the next Spotify. The reason being is that when you're an angel investor, 
or you're in a hedge fund or wherever it may be, you have many stories of success, but also many, if not more stories of failures, of times that you've missed out on a particular deal. You missed out on an Uber deal. You missed out back in Spotify when they first launched because you didn't believe in the app or something along those kind of lines. So usually these kind of guys and girls are looking at ways to make up for those mistakes. So they go extra hard on things that may sound just a little bit more believable than something else. And sometimes the due diligence in terms of, you know, um, going through the books, finding out if the, you know, technology that they're basically... Um, um, touting works the way it does work doesn't necessarily go the way it needs to go and from what i understand about the fairness case the due diligence or whoever kind of investigated the claims that fairness made was basically handled by one person and that person was working if i'm not mistaken part-time or something stupid like that so there, there's not many checks and balances when it comes to investment most of it is really down to how easy is most most of it is kind of comes down to that elevator pitch idea where it's like can you convince me from the ground floor to wherever I have to go that you have a business I should be should is worthy of my attention and then can you take that attention and present to me a deck and take that deck and present to me terms and then you get the money wired to your, to your account and you can be able to kind of grow your company invest in you know in salary and all that malarkey you're gonna going forward that's what basically kind of leads to so it kind of breeds for a kind of fake it till you make it society in the startup world for the most part and I've seen it firsthand having worked in many startups over my career I've seen many companies where sometimes not knowing and pretending you do know in the beginning can serve you the best and you end up becoming the next big thing but sometimes if you're you know pretend you don't know what you're doing eventually that can kind of catch up onto you when you start scaling and the requirements and then the requirements that are being kind of asked on you or being requested of you you can't necessarily meet that's when you kind of run into a lot of trouble that way too so that can happen as well so i don't think it's really fair to kind of you know paint elizabeth home as like oh this is the end of the girl boss thing but i really touching and sad part of this story is this article here courtesy of the daily mail which again it's what i'm saying is just really interesting when it comes to these sort of stories where i guess because they can't necessarily go to trial over something like this because again there's no way of proving if this is true or false or if elizabeth holmes have anything to do with this guy passing but the trial is mainly centered around the cases of fraud right the fact that these investors are trying to recoup whatever money they've lost or kind of you know uh, bring her to justice because they feel like they've been swindled and made to look like fools but the amount of people that have been hurt around it whether it's the patients or people working around it like this one i'm about to read to you now they don't have any real justice right she's only been tried for the basically the swindling of money and not for the lives that she's impacted cost or whatever it may be that's the real harsh part of the whole story so it's cursed your daily mail and it said how my husband fell victim to silicon valley's bad blood billionaire widow of a brilliant Br british scientist says um he was driven to suicide by the bogus blood test device invented by elizabeth home who now stands trial for 500 million fraud so she's not even been tried for this so this scientist that worked on the fairness project um drove himself to suicide um obviously the wife is alleging that he did it because he felt as if his voice wasn't being heard he was flagging up concerns about the machine she was obviously strong arming him or dismissing him and it got to a point where he basically felt like he you know the best option would be to end his life allegedly that's what she's basically saying and if that is true then she should stand to trial for this as well but i guess they can't prove it in a court of law and they think the best way to go for it is to maybe go for the fraud cases so that's a sad part of it so it continues here we we'll read for the guardian it says um like many who gravitated to Silicon Valley, British scientist Ian Gobbins, or so Ian Gibbons, was drawn by his California can-do spirit. And when in 20, 2005 he was appointed science, chief scientist at the Theranos, then held as a most can-do venture of all, he was determined to help it achieve its ambition and revolutionise medicine on a grand scale. It's Wonder Kid, um, it's Wonder Kid, sorry, founder Elizabeth Holmes, just 19 when she launched the company. God damn it, no wonder people were impressed. She was 19 launching a company like this. Because imagine if it would have worked. Like, that would have been life-altering. Do you know what I mean? That would legitimately have made her like a billionaire 10 times over. Um, claimed to have developed an automated blood testing device that with a single pinprick on the patient's finger could detect hundreds of diseases and substances from cancer to cocaine and would help save millions of lives. Instead, Ian's widow, Rochelle, told the Daily Mail this week that Frenos says evil chief executive Holmes cost him his life after he dared to challenge their claims to have protected um, and their claims to have perfected their miracle diagnosis machine. As a rigorous and honest scientist, he soon realized his grandiose claims for the device were hollow and that it actually put patients lives at risk in may 2013 the, the night before he was summoned to home's office for what he was certain would be sacking and given that he was 67 the end of his career ian took an overdose of painkillers and he died of a week later like tragic tragic story a quote here says and you know holmes never said anything said rochelle she never offered her condolences helped or anything she was just a bitch instead rochelle simply received a call from fairness asking her to return any company property oh my god for a 
happens at home. This week, Elizabeth Holmes' moral character is once again under scrutiny after her tro- after she went to try and San Jose, California. And again, I've been there, man. I've worked for flipping, you know, <coughs> Nicholas Oliver, um, flipping dickhead, you know, founders who claimed their startup did one thing, but it did it did com- neither of what they were basically claiming. Neither no, it did completely nothing. Right? It was just a complete, f- an, you know, a complete farce, an illusion, a mirage. Let's say right. And they had the similar sort of thing. They never apologized. They never felt like they were responsible for the failings of the company that led to people being put out of work and set back their career for many, many years, right? They never was one to apologize for it and they probably never will. So you're going to have to come to a point where you basically are able to move on. Your, you, you have to come to a point where you're able to accept and move on as opposed to waiting for an apology from the said person that just is never going to happen especially when you're a narcissist sociopath like these sort of people it continues says she is charged with 12 counts of fraud and conspiracy to commit fraud via financials involving the use of telecommunications and internet along with her former business partner and ex-lover Ramsey Sunny Balwani Homestead Balwani who tried next year had has denied the changes um da, 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 da. any more quotes from the mum? no for the lady here Oh, yes, it's here. Rachel Gibbons has been following the case closely and wishes her husband Ian could be there. She said, It's really hard to think that he committed suicide not knowing the rest of the story. And she told the Daily Mail. She's particularly shocked at the recent revelations that Holmes' lawyers say that she will claim her judgment was impaired because of the emotional and sexual abuse suffered by Belwani, who's 20 years her senior. Um, alleging that he monitored her calls, emails and phone messages and would hold hard, sharp objects at her during their decade-long relationship. And uh, um, the wife of the widow, oh, sorry, the widow says the following, it's a weird defense because she started off as being the sort of superwoman, right? No one was going to get in her face and now she's ending the week with a leak with little I'm a new mommy defense. But on another level, Rochelle Gibbons isn't remotely surprised. She says she's a sociopath, so she's never going to accept blame. There she is there. Like many, she's she has no doubt Gilf Gilms' guilt. She says there's no question she intentionally misled people. The worst thing is that she unleashed a fraud on patients. So yeah, let's see, man. I'm I'm curious to see if she's actually gonna face any criminal punishment. I don't necessarily think she's gonna get any jail time personally. I think she's probably gonna have to pay massive fines, which she evidently have to pay over a series of years because she probably doesn't have any money to her name. I don't know what kind of career she's gonna to be able to, you know, start for herself after this, but I can easily see her moving moving into crypto or moving into the flipping nft world very easily people will be kind of swooned and persuaded by her idea of you know pursuing a new you know you know breaking through new realms and stuff in the world of crypto and nfts i can see that happening but in terms of her sitting in a jail cell jail cell anytime soon i just don't see it i really really don't personally but you know i could be proven wrong but yeah i'm, I'm gripped to it as well i'm actually gripped as watching this from the outside and i cannot lie Next on the list, we've got this funny story. This is courtesy of uh, Mix Mixmag. Tiesto's fans' ashes shot from the confetti cannon at Creamfields. At first, I saw it. So I was like, you know what? This is fucking ridiculous, super corny, and just goes to show how kind of um, how different the world of EDM is to any other world that exists within the electronic or dance music scene it's just its own little entity that doesn't really make any sense and people are absolutely batshit crazy over there but in another sense especially post lockdown and being able to go back into clubs again I can understand why people who go to these events feel like that's their whole lives or they kind of frame their whole personality don't get me wrong there's nothing worse about there's nothing worse than framing your entire personality on your one your interest whether it be DJing nightlife music you know whatever cricket it's just a bit cringe but i can understand as well when you're older and you have much many things going on in your life where you legitimately think the one thing that kind of does give you purpose or does give you reasons to live is the possibility of going to flip in tomorrowland every single year right it's a whole thing it's a whole ceremony you stay in a tent you meet new people you try different bits of food you trip your head you trip your balls off of mushrooms and lsd and mdma and whatever else you can kind of shove up your body i understand so I kind of get this idea that, you know, if you if your time does come, that one of your last wishes will be for your ashes to be spread all over the place when, you know, the, when the confetti cannon goes on. But I can't imagine being in a party like that and having someone's remains being spread all over my face or kind of, you know, dousing all over my tongue and me thinking it's a dab of LSD or something like that kind of, you know, fills me with dread. But again you know when your time does come it doesn't really matter where you're buried or where you are really because you're not here in it so it continues here it says a Chester fan who passed away in July was commemorated at Creamfields this weekend where his ashes were scattered from from confetti cannons. Stuart Mitchell took his own life in July. His family sold his Creamfield ticket which he booked ahead of the bank holiday weekend in order to pray for his funeral. That is grim isn't it? 
Jesus Christ. He took his life in July before the, f- the festival happened, not, not, not too soon before it. Then his family had to sell his ticket to pay for his funeral. God damn, this is sad. Cousins um, Ryan and Liam bought the tickets from Mitchell's family, who then asked if they could scatter some of Stuart's ashes at the, at the festival, so he truly went there one last time. In a letter to cousin Stuart's family, he wrote, this is a little this is a, a little of my son Stuart ashes. I could be most grateful if you could be a scattered them somewhere in Cranesfields. The cousins then decided to dedicate their weekend at Cranesfield to Stuart and have two banners printed with a picture of him and his son reading, this is his last dance for you, mate, asking the event organizers if they could take the banner onto the main stage. Staff responded and said, absolutely bowled over by the request and help the DJs to hold it up during the set you know what that's cool but that does feel that that is fucking nasty and really freaky but it does make me tear up a little bit it does make me feel a little bit emotional to find you know to see that these guys went out of their way to do such a thing to honor the family's wishes in that way i'm hoping this is what the guy wanted before he did take his life and he maybe left a note to his family to do this but it does you know make me quite sad that he had to leave you know kind of ex- self-expire and then his family didn't have any money to basically um, pay for his funeral that they had to sell the ticket and then ask strangers for a favor like this is flipping you know fills me with dread but it also does fill me with absolute glee that these human beings random you know only thing that connects them is this festival we're able to kind of come together and make this dream or make this kind of thing come true like this is really really cool um the, the, the staff then suggested that they put the Stuart's ashes into a confetti cannon on Chester's closing set on Sunday night. When they agreed, his family responded saying it was the first bit of good news they'd received since Stuart passed away. Bless them. I thought, oh my goodness, he's at Crinsfield, said one family member, but I'd not expect to be blown out of a cannon, she added, saying that the cousin's effort had 100% helped with the grieving process. Stuart was at Tiesto's, was Tiesto a super fan who was at his funeral, was celebrated with his favourite song, A Day Go for Strings. Ryan Miller said that the confetti tribute was an unforgettable homage to someone who had taken his earth far before this time Stuart Mitchell's family are now advocating to awareness of UF suicide raising money for charities they've raised 1,200 pounds so far but yeah bloody hell man that is dark dark shit but actually good shit in some regard and again having been without the race having been without the possibility of going out and suddenly being back out outdoors on the dance floor taking you know what it's just been I can't imagine having not having that in my life so I, I, I I can kind of sympathize with the guy, but Jesus, that's sad, isn't it? Jesus, that's sad. <laughs> I can't deny that's sad as hell. Ooh. Moving on um, to news concerning people going out and stuff. This is interesting, right? Because of mixed mag, and it kind of speaks a lot to of the pains and the troubles people have been having going out nowadays, especially with people overdosing or unfortunately not being able to handle the drugs that they're taking now. There's been several cases of people passing away in nightclubs across the UK. There's obviously that case that happened in Berlin at the suicide club with somebody allegedly overdosing going on. Um, on GHB, obviously in LA, um, there's been the case happening with those comedians that unfortunately passed away with cocaine laced with fentanyl. And then most recently, we had Michael K. Williams unfortunately passing away also with what they're alleging was heroin laced with fentanyl too. So there's definitely been an issue with drugs um, in this kind of new normal that we're living in at the moment. And I've long hypothesized that part of the reason has been the lockdown. I think in general, looking back in history, when we look back at this time, we'll definitely see that the lockdowns were definitely had far more negative than they did positives, especially when it comes to dealing with people within the, you know, the young sector, maybe say, say 35 and under, who basically live to socialise, live to be around, travel and all that good stuff. And especially considering that the virus didn't, you know, disproportionate didn't affect them as much as it did affect people in in the older ages especially in the beginning of the covid um pandemic we're gonna see definitely that this pand this lockdown process or this lockdown uh, approach was definitely a lot more destructive than it was helpful because of the fact that people were locked in at home had nowhere to go out there was no socializing all that kind of stuff was obviously something that was off the cards which then led to people going i think going over and above to make up for lost time and i've i've seen for myself and again i'm somebody that I would describe myself as like a cringy enough as like a power raver if that made sense right prior to COVID I was going I was going to Berlin at least three times a year sometimes two right I was going to Berlin I'd be going out every weekend I'd be DJing in clubs from like Friday to further to Saturday sometimes um, and I'd be going out Friday to Sunday every single weekend so I was going out all the fucking time 
and my endurance for raving and for being outdoors and getting drunk and being high was super high, right? No pun intended, really, really high. I could go out back to back to back to back and not really feel none the worse, especially if I made sure that my Monday and Friday was tight and I was eating healthy and I was sleeping on time and waking up on time to go to work and work out and stuff. I was particularly fine. But even I've found in myself with the last 18 or 14 months or so of inactivity of not being able to go to parties, again, I didn't really misbehave. I didn't go to a play grave. I didn't go to any illegal parties in the forest or anything. I made, I mostly stayed indoors and if ever I needed a bit of a dance or a boogie, me and my friends will go book uh, a slot at Pirate Studios and have a bit of a dance there. But I've been out of step for a long time. And even I saw for myself going to our first couple of raves, it took me a long time to kind of get up to the level that I was at prior. And I'm still not going to be there. I don't probably think I'll ever get back to that level because it's just it's just not the same tempo that we're living at the moment, especially from working from home. Things have just changed in, in general. But even I could see that level that I was at prior was really excessive and I couldn't get back to that level again. So I can only imagine for the kids who have never had the experience of being able to go out prior to COVID because they just turned 18 maybe during this span, right? In 21 or maybe 2020 last year. So to finally be able to go to the club now and then take your first pill or get high or get drunk or whatever it may be without eating too much and just being you know sweaty in a club somewhere, I can understand it leading to some really mad situation, especially on top of it when you add in this... Um, with obviously with the lack of lorry drivers and obviously the the takedown that happened recently in Encro chat where a lot of you know big pill manufacturers were taken down and you know basically sent to prison which basically led to a real drought in terms of the quality of drugs available out on the market so you've got the lack of movement of these drugs in the first place you've got the lack of supply because most of these people are in jail and then in terms of covid you've got the lack of um su supply chain happening because of the disruption that's been going on and people prioritizing other things and also you've got the other thing i think which i mentioned in the article is that supposedly with the supply chain being disrupted as much as it is drug dealers now are preferring to basically take but bigger risk and basically send stuff like cocaine and heroin through instead of advice instead of going with the pills and stuff because there's obviously there's a far bigger margin um in selling something like a cocaine vis-a-vis -vis selling pills and whatnot which is then leading to a dearth and the quality of pills and the pills that are coming here are bush to shit and not really that great and you know it's it's leading to again to kids basically overdosing getting into these weird weird um scenarios where basically people are getting sick on a dance floor because they've not had the ability to go out for the last 18 months and they're trying to make up for lost time that's basically my hypothesis i think about it but let's continue with the article it says the uk has been experiencing an mdma shortage according to experts and the drought can be traced back to covid19 brexit and subsequent disruption to supply chains it's thought that the recent reduction in heavy goods vehicles transporting items across the uk has also had an effect on disruption of the substance speaking to the metro naheem eastwood um said the um, sorry executive director of the drugs charity release explained that the shortage could certainly be a result of the reduction of hgvs carrying goods in from europe where illegal goods would easily be concealed amongst legal products and where suppliers um have prioritize getting their more lucrative drugs such as cocaine and heroin which i mentioned before indeed since england has currently one of the um only european countries in which clubs are open mdma producers in the netherlands and the main manufacturers area may have seen the industry as profitable may not see the industry as profitable enough until festivals and clubs return to their usual scale which i think if i'm not surprised if i'm not in if i'm not um incorrect Netherlands clubs I think closed recently right and they're meant to reopen either now or November October I'm not too sure so yeah that does make a lot of sense um it says here Eastwood continues and said like many other goods that are imported into the UK we are seeing that supply chains for some illicit substances affected although that this has been a regulated um, market it is hard to pin it down and it's likely the result of a number of different factors the difficulties in assessing um, MDMA has led to a rise in fake alternatives at clubs and festivals drug testing and advice charity The Loop reported that only half of the MDMA tested at Lost Village Festival only half right unless a big festival happened in Lost Village happening if I'm not mistaken that bank holiday weekend in August right only half actually contain the substance instead party girls had been sold a mixture of substance of substitute substances such as 4cmc 3cmc or ethanol all of which are reported to cause anxiety paranoia and more intense redosing so uh, more than half of the drugs that were ingested that people at lost village one of our bigger festivals one of our most well-run festivals by the looks of it, it looks flipping amazing the sound looks really cool too or it sounds really amazing for the clips i've seen it sounds like because you know most of the festivals in the uk if you're not uh, if you're not aware have a real issue with sound especially if they're next residential areas sound pollution council people complaining blah blah blah, blah which leads to a sometimes a subpar experience but from what i've seen in clips and stuff it's really really good very well produced so if they even had that issue especially when you consider you know the tickets there 
aren't cheap. So people that are going have, you know, disposable income. You'd imagine they're not going to be buying cheap shit for the sake of it. If they're not able to find good stuff, you know, God, God, God forgive or God you know put some blessing on the kid that's just going out with 20 quid to his name imagine what he's going to be able to accure when he goes out to the club it continues here said last month there were reports of fake mdma containing 4cmc circuit in manchester though the substances um has been used to pad out illegal substances before it's been found to have been a much concentration recently of course because of anchor chat takedown all that malarkey the manchester drug analysis and knowledge exchange um issued warnings on social media that Mandrake's director, Dr. Oliver Sutcliffe, told the Daily Mail, these compounds are potentially more harmful, but the fact that they're not fully understood, therefore people don't really understand what these doses of things to um, to take or what happens if they take in combination. Since clubs were opened in the UK, there's been a number of high-profile instances of related um, harmful batches of ecstasy. In July 2nd, people died in Bristol and further 20 hospitalized after taking a blue test of the pill that contained super strength MDMA. So yeah, it's a mad time out there, but again, most of it i think has come to as a response or most of it i think is an effect of lockdowns obviously then on top of that the encro chat takedown definitely disrupted a lot of it but covid and the lockdowns in general has definitely fucked up people's tolerance levels and ability to just you know take drugs in general um it's definitely messed up people's idea of how to take drugs when they're outdoors maybe because they've been doing a little bit too much indoors and when you go outdoors you maybe then you know go ab above and beyond what you're doing indoors too with the dosage from malarkey and then of course just in general in the uk we have a very bad relationship when it comes to allowing or understanding why people go outdoors and take drugs and drink and whatever we're really draconian in that weird way so people are having to buy stuff in the black markets they don't get it tested it's just a whole shit show of situation but finally thankfully we have some kind of insight into what's going on and i think as sad as it is these high profile deaths have put a bit of awareness and maybe a bit conscious about making sure that they're buying stuff legit they're checking stuff on pill report they are asking advice from friends they're calling up people at loop they're buying test kits which are you know really really cheap if you're not sure on what drugs you're taking if what quality they are and are hoping that way you can go out and have as best time as possible and not be in any spot of bother you would hope you would hope da 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 then we have this um well how long i think i was thinking for an hour i think i think i think for an hour but let's continue. I think that might be. I was thinking for an hour already. I think I'm thinking for an hour, haven't I? I think I've been speaking for an hour. Let's see if I've been speaking for an hour. I think I have. Oof, hour and ten. That's that's a lot of time in it. That is a lot of time. But we continue. Um, what else we want to talk about here today? Yeah, this is courtesy of um GQ style, which I thought was a fairly obvious article but i guess now the fashion industry is finally waking up to the realities of the normal world that we live in and they've kind of decided or kind of finally woken up to the fact that these hallowed institutions like fashion schools and stuff are not as necessary or as important as they once believed it to be in terms of making or creating or providing the platform for the next big great fashion superstar and most kids especially when starting enough their brands on instagram have a basically higher possibility of maybe ending up being the creator director of these hallowed studios or hallowed fashion houses more so than people that come out of conventional university because they've actually practiced the skill of actually becoming an entrepreneur becoming a business person supplying their wares to various different shops and whatnot running a studio all these kind of things that basically they don't really teach you in uni where they basically prioritize or they basically tell you your dream should be to go out there get an internship working for a big house and then slowly but surely make your way through the industry that way and then maybe at the end of it you may be able to launch your own brand but now these new kids coming up are just completely jumping over all those steps they're following the lead of something like a Virgil something like a Matthew Williams there's even someone to a extent of like a Harry Preston who I mentioned a lot because I've I, I, I met him a few times back in the day when he used to have his blog early early on I think maybe 2005 ish times I don't really remember but he was never really a fashion guy he was maybe a, a ideas kind of cool design sort of dude maybe in a similar sort of guy so like a Tom Sachs right you never don't you don't really think of Tom Sachs as a as a fashion dude but you definitely think if he was able to give him a um the keys to a studio he could put together a pretty decent collection and obviously Harry Preston has great ideas he appreciates he approaches um things in a really fresh innovative innovative way but even what he's doing in fashion should be an eye-opener 
similar to some kids because again he's not a quintessential fashion dude but he's able to absolutely smash it and if anything i would say i would argue out of the three in that kind of group of the bin chill boys of him matthew williams and obviously virgil i think her impressor might have the most impressive brand especially considering again he doesn't have a conventional fashion background and i think a lot of the kids are seeing people like that and thinking you know what he's stocked in all the stores i want to be stocked in he has an amazing fashion week show that he puts on every season i want to emulate that i'm going to just do what he does do you know what i mean and just start my own brand and start selling direct to market and hopefully down the line you can maybe link up with new guys group and you know you can production could be handled that way and you could maybe get blow up that way and do collaborations duh, 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 duh. but it all starts from that kind of building your own brand and having you know scores of people and fans that like what you do and then have them basically preach the gospel of your brand to others and you can kind of acquiesce that way and this article from gq touches upon it and basically puts into print which basically solidifies the thing and people will probably listen to this more so listen to me so let's read the article it says um the title is what um, want to make it in fashion build fanatics it's written by a lady called rachel tashian um, who i follow on, in, on twitter she's a fairly decent follower in there so definitely check her out i'll put the link in the twitter description sorry in my description if you want to check it so the article starts as follows it seems like everyone with the foot in fashion has a award this year has an award these days but the crown jewel and the indisputable is still the lvmh prize which the conglomerate awards annually to top up coming um, to top up and coming uh, uh, to up and coming designers with the level of ceremony that is tantamount to an uh, anointment. The jury that had that has a record of spotting stars, Grace Wallace Bonner, Marion Sir, Hood by Air, Jack Moose are all past winners. And it's not just a trophy. The 300,000 euros for the grand prize winner plus a year's mentorship from LVMH have helped form a new generation of icons in an industry that can be unsparing to young talent. The winners of this year's new edition were announced on Tuesday morning, 27-year-old Nessine Joka, an Albanian women's wear designer in London, took home the grand prize. The Carl Lagerfeld Prize, a special prize renamed for the late chanel design in 2019 was shared by three winners the american designer colm dylan um the design um, the, who designed streetwearish women's and men under the name kid super um lukuyano dingy um a south african designer of a graceful men's and women's clothes and ruse ruby zoo a shanghai based designer of freaky genderless experiments of knitwear um, it continues here. You see, obviously, some examples of their past work. Obviously, it's pretty decent. Um, the Lagerfeld winners described being somewhat starstruck by the LVMH designers who serve as a grand prize jury. Kim Jones, Mark Jacobs, Virgil Abloh, and Jonathan Anderson. Lagerfeld may be one of the most legendary names in fashion, but for today's 20-something hopefuls, it's the crop of these designers who are the icons, especially because of well, especially because of the way that Jacobs and, and, and Abloh misshaped streetwear, pop culture, and high fashion at Louis Vuitton. Jacobs was the creative director of the house from 1987 to 2014 when arcs how success might look different today than it did for designers of jacob generation or lagerfeld the designers pointed out resolutely to a shift in the balance of power away from the establishment blessing and towards a fanatical fan base which has always been the case that's what i've always argued whenever when it was obviously poised that virgil was going to be the head of louis vuitton men's people were scoffing oh he shouldn't do it he's crabby shit i don't like his design copies copies but the fact of the matter was he built such a following at off-white and with all these collaborations, that it made sense that why LVMH would consider him for Louis Vuitton because they were just thinking of it from a purely mathematical equation. LVMH, LVMH men's is dead. We need somebody to rejuvenate it who has their finger on the pulse, who has the who has the kind of the finger on the, you know, who can kind of anti, anti, what's a thing called antithesis antithesis whatever that word is called the moment that's going on in culturally right um, is tapped into the cultural zeitgeist is able to talk to the people or talk to the kids who are basically buying the stuff at the moment and the best option the most obvious option was obviously a virgil abloh are there better more talented more kind of uh high people that can execute on a high level than virgil exists out there probably but are there people that can maybe execute to the level that he does in terms of volume in terms of output in terms of scale in terms of just thinking broadly about how to present brands probably not especially somebody that's tapped into what's going on nowadays in terms of the scene so for me it made complete sense even when it comes to Matthew Williams, that made sense too. And don't obviously be surprised too if you see Harry Preston end up kind of helming another big house very soon, I think, coming up in the cars if he doesn't decide to just knuckle down and keep doing his brand that he's got running at the moment, his namesake. But that was always the case. I thought always the case was always to make it that way. 
you know, obviously make your own brand direct to consumer and then hopefully use that brand as like a kind of calling card, as a CV to show off what you can do in the hope that you can get that big grand prize that can legitimize you in the scene because everyone wants to be legitimized. You want to be stamped. You want to be approved by your peers. You want to get that acknowledgement and then use that to kind of segue and continue on because basically as soon as you've got, as soon as you've got, you've got that job at LV, he's cemented, right? His legacy is done in fashion. He can do no wrong. He's got a job for life. He's completely, he's completely done. He's okay in that regard. So I can definitely see that happen. But I was just shocked why the fashion industry didn't understand why that wasn't that didn't make sense they just still had this idea that it's a it's a merit meritocracy in terms of like only the best designers design at the best houses and it's never been the case especially nowadays um no one cares about that at the moment people especially with the access of clothes that people have from high street clothes to you know stuff from random people's instagram pages and big cartel pages and stuff there's too much clothes out there at the moment so if you want people to go to your high fashion brand you need to create something you need to have a draw you need to have an appeal something there and if you can get somebody that's already got their appeal on a draw and you can give them the access to your Willy wonka factory in terms of what virgil's got at Louis Vuitton you know you're gonna hit at the park and so far so good just look at what John Vance has done at Flippin' Loebe, for instance. Come on, man. Um, so he continues here. It says, I think back in the day, if somebody co-signed you, it made a huge difference, said Kid Super Dylan. Um, now it's all about branding your own community. Uh, sorry, well, now it's all about building your own community. I understand agree with that. Making sure a co-sign doesn't even matter. The press was run by people who could open doors and close doors. Now the press is Instagram. Um, uh, da, 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 da. if you can build a real community for yourself that's more important than one article but back in the day one article could change your life exactly imagine a, imagine a um imagine if kanye west would have done his collection now they remember his first one at paris fashion week i think that might have been like 2013 or something imagine he presented it nowadays i think the reception would be a far more forgiving because more of his fans would be ones responding and approving of what he does you know yeah it would be kind of deciding whether or not it's a yeah or a nay whereas back in 2013 there was still that kind of gatekeeper type thing where what was that woman called the kathy horns of this world if she writes a scathing review about your collection you're done you're out of here but nowadays the reviewer the person that's basically telling you whether or not what you're doing is good or valid or not are the paying customers does your stuff sell out is there, is there demand for it do they leave comments are they pestering you for this item do they want to see your new collection all this sort of kind of communication and feedback you're getting is the review this is the indication of whether or not you're going in the right direction or not not what the flipping um, editors say and more importantly what's shifting on the shop floor right you go to a shop floor you go to a rack say oh have you got this stuff in the size xl or larger in the popular sizes no it's all sold out okay accurately you can see that there's a demand for this item people are seeking it out in store and trying it on liking what it feels like in hand and then the to buy which is a big step similar to like having people come in to see you in an arena or in a gig somewhere right it, like selling out 300 capacity stadium place is still a better it's like in music same sort of thing it's much better to stay independent and sell out a 300 capacity venue somewhere in your local town continue consistently um you know especially album after album or ep after ep and then use the evidence to then present a record label and get better terms for yourself as opposed to going straight to record label getting that loan and then get locked in a shitty deal and then and then, and then you know and then again you go into you go to record label blank with nothing just just your talent you have no fan base so that if your records do flop there's no one to kind of cushion your fall if something goes wrong because if the virgil because i always argue if the virgil louis vuitton thing didn't go as well as it has done he st he's all right he's still got off-white he's still got all his collaborations he's okay do you know what i mean obviously it would be embarrassing and whatnot to see and whatnot but he's still got a career that he can kind of come back on and he's still got fans who can basically cushion his fall and say you know what fuck that we go again next time whereas if it was prior and he was someone who just came out fresh out of uni you do a bad job at one house that you that's your name kind of blacklisted and seen forever do you know what i mean it continues here it says i totally agree with com said Medingi. It's about um, community now. People are moving in a way where they're looking for a connection. They're looking for a tribe. And it doesn't necessarily have to be those who have media powers. At a click of a button, you literally have the opportunity to follow or unfollow people that you don't like, you like or dislike. Exactly. It's instant approval, instant dislike. In some ways, this is the focus of communities a long time coming. It's been the same feeling that designers are reported tapping into this time last year. And also United Designers highlighting our August issue. It's notable that cultivating community requires just as much work, if not more, than currying for the favor of an editor. And and it always should i would much rather like i've always argued this that's why i hate the london scene for so many other reasons but one of the reasons why i hate it because at the time that i was coming up there was a real big 
there was a real big importance placed on sucking people's dicks in order to get to certain places. And don't get me wrong, there's certain people that I know, certain friends of mine or, or acquaintances who have been able to use that to their advantage, right? They you know, to suck the right dicks or be in the right places, pat the right people on the back, be the right big friend to people and it helped them in their career and they are super successful now in what they're doing. Congrats. But not everybody can do that. And I don't think everyone should be required to do that. I think if you want to do that, you can, but everyone should be required to do that. What they should enforce is that if you want to be a success in whatever scene you're in, it's better you invest in your dreams, work hard in pursuing those things. Don't fake it until you make it. Actually try to make it, make the thing, ship the thing, sell the thing, produce the thing, put on the show, whatever it may be, and then use that as an opportunity to curry favor from the people that you want to get friends with. I'd, I'd much rather if I was, if I was flipping... Jonathan Ive, I'd much rather some kid come up to me in a lift somewhere at Ace Hotel and show me his store that he's designed chairs and furniture and, you know, stationery and whatnot. And he's selling this stuff and he wants to have some, bounce some ideas or maybe do an internship there, what he's doing. Then a guy just coming up, just trying to be my friend so he can hang around, get clout off me and then work as what? The front of house in my studio somewhere. That's not necessarily the exchange that I want. I want to basically inspire the next generation to kind of be better than me going forward that way. But it's always mostly the middle management people, the people that don't really call, the, the people that aren't really the shot callers they're the ones that usually tell you to kind of whack people off and stuff because that's what they did to get their job but if you really want to be a creator you want to be a change maker you want to leave your little notch on a timeline of fashion or creative history or wherever you're from you have to just do the thing carrying favor and being you know the friends of people it can only get you so far in the end your work needs to be your work and i think that's something that people can never kind of um use as a stick to beat Virgil with yeah say whatever you want about his quality what he does if you like it or don't like it the fact of the matter is there's no one out there more prolific than him when it comes to just pure output he is creating on a level that's just insane the amount of stuff he does like look at his Instagram now he's suddenly now he's on tour he's, he's a DJ now do you know what I mean he's just doing shows recently now suddenly he's, he's gone into DJ mode he's been designing merch he's going to be doing fashion show Q&A's and whatnot soon another collection soon with um with LV dropping the Air Force Ones are going to be dropping very soon they're going to cultivate uh, you know there's be articles are written about those you know from from until the end of time now that they suddenly drop resale market is going to go in crazy that's because it just works hard and he produces quality what the people like simple as that or the, you know, obviously it helps that he's friends with kanye and all this sort of stuff he's got the right connections but at the same time he does the work he does the work it continues here um it's notable duh, duh, duh. now it seems fashion is in the midst of a of a sea change like the one that took place in rap music a few years ago when soundcloud listeners become the bench barometer of stardom rather than the magic one of russell simmons or jay-z true um but the young fashion followers are almost more fanatical than soundcloud listeners on instagram for example a number of the of, of deep fashion comment accounts like i deserve couture duh, 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 or whatever that is have gained recognition over the past year for combining the almost religious fervor of barb twitter with the unsparing morality of Diet Prada. They are eager to prop up stars like Bianca Saunders and Christopher John, John Rogers, two other finalists of the prize. Um, da, 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 da. By the time the designers win something like the LVMH Prize, they already built up a cult following and legion supporters making the prize monetary component perhaps the most valuable asset. If designers doesn't win it, they still can get their stands like um, Jose, Jose Corrales created a prayer circle on Twitter for Christopher John Rose on Monday night in hopes that it would make him home the grand prize. <clears throat> so amazing to see in some ways, Lager for the winners represent the three prongs of the contemporary fashion industry, um, the streetwear upstarts in Dylan, the independent-minded designers, designer in Mindengi, and the entrepreneurial and the entrepreneurial Zhu or Suzo, is it Ho or Zhou, who has an intimate ab ambition for a brand that reaches far beyond the realms of fashion into the marriage of consumer products. It says, "I can't stress the Dylan. I started with T-shirts, and now, and no one would ar ar no one around me was doing fashion fashion." He said. His winning was a testament to breaking through as well as a testament to evolving, adding that when he started, he had no idea what a prize like this even, even existed. Yeah, that's probably the biggest one, Kid Super. Because if I remember him correctly, he did these like wacky all over print hoodies and tracksuits and shit. And I never really thought he was a fashion head. I just always assumed he was kind of like a like a, I don't know, like an only NY kind of thing, right? I, I, I don't know. I just never assumed he was kind of one he wanted to get into the fashion realm. But I guess in terms of in terms of a lucrative avenue and an avenue where he can maybe you know differentiate himself and kind of solidify himself as an artist more so it maybe made sense to kind of segue into the kind of fashion side of things and have very sort of you know look just look at this dress right have very kind of uh performative kind of performance art exhibitions and shows and whatnot yeah you know i mean he could easily do that in fashion scene more so maybe in the streetwear scene side of things but that's awesome to see he's even got his own footwear it looks like he's dabbling in there kept super shoes nice to see 
And then to end it, it says, Ndigi pointed out the importance of staying to course, sounding a bit like Grace Boz Bonner or Marine Saar, the two designers. She says the following, being in this digital world, it's so easy to start comparing ourselves. It's a human thing, but for anyone to, to reach their full potential, you have to be who you are. It's just it's just about having that strong, steady sense of moving in a way that makes sense to you. And I 100% agree with that. But yeah, it's glad, I'm glad to see the fashion world finally waking up to the idea that, you know, the to the realization that what Virgil Heron and Matthew Williams did by cultivating a fan base online, especially through Instagram via their own brands and just their Instagram platforms in general, is what eventually led to these big fashion houses deciding, hey, we need to back you guys. We need to put some money behind you. We need to basically give you the keys to our house because we want to tap into those same people because they're the ones that really invest in fashion. They're really buying the thing. Do you know what I mean? Not these critics that sit around on show studio, dissect everything, but don't buy anything in any kind of store because those guys get on my nerves. They're always critiquing and talking about shit, but it's like, what's the last piece of you know um, luxury fashion or high fashion that you actually purchase yourself everything that they get is always at cost or free and shit it's like you're not invested in it you're not a consumer you're not into this thing for the love like we are you're just here to be critical and hear the sound of your own voice you know what I mean but yeah congrats to this article um, and congrats to kind of solidifying what I've always thought so yeah congrats to me pat myself on the back cha-ching cha-ching <laughs> it's funny when you do, when you find things that kind of you know um, affirm whatever else you've been thinking you always kind of go on a little bit more extra with these kind of things but hey here we are here we are um you know what i might leave it there you know because i think i might be a good place to end the show right now that's the actual show episode number 493 or is it 494 one of them anyway you, you heard at the beginning of the show thanks so much for tuning in good to hear from you guys again if it's your first time checking out the show via youtube please make sure you smash the like button hit subscribe and leave a comment down below and of course if you listen via the podcast app a five star review and a share will help the show go a long way um new bonus punch but bonus patreon episode coming at the end of this week so make sure you subscribe on there too link to the patreon in the description don't delay and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe peace